Hey everybody, some gadget guy here, and if you don't already know this about me, I do a lot of work in commercial voiceover. I'm a commercial casting director. I don't usually sit in front of the microphone. I'm usually working with other actors on their auditions or directing sessions for commercial projects, animation, things like that. So as I spend a lot of time in recording studios, I get asked about microphones pretty regularly. I've, I've been working in front of mixing consoles and working with mics for the better part of 15 years now. And uh, while I never went to school to be a recording engineer, I've stolen a lot of tricks from people who are actually pretty good engineers. Very often actors or podcasters will ask me about which mic they should buy, and then I'll ask them what mic they're currently using or which mics they're interested in. And very often, especially from newbies getting into this business, they'll reply with something like a USB microphone which doesn't really tell me a lot about what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, you see, USB is a connection interface. So that's the way that you connect a microphone to a computer. That doesn't actually tell me what kind of microphone you're looking at. It would be sort of like if you were telling me you were looking at a quarter inch jack microphone or an XLR connector microphone. All you folks out there trying to produce really cool looking video content or podcasts or vlogs, and you're looking at nicer cameras and lenses and video editing software, well, the world of microphones is vast. And there are just as many different options and tools for microphones, just like there would be lenses for your camera. We're gonna take a look at the different types of mics that I've used, primarily focusing on spoken word recording. So if you're trying to do some home recording, some voiceover, you wanna do some audition, or if you're looking at podcasting and vlogging, these are the types of mics that I've had experience capturing the human voice, the human instrument. And hopefully we'll be able to narrow down your options a little bit better than just telling me how you wanna connect the mic to your computer. Starting off with this puppy right here, this is the Blue Yeti Pro. Now this is a USB microphone in that it can connect to a computer either via USB or through traditional microphone cabling, an XLR connector. But the type of recording diaphragm in this microphone is what we would call a small diaphragm condenser. For a lot of your mid-range USB microphones, this is most often the element or diaphragm you will find inside these types of mics. They're crisp, they're articulate, they're sensitive. You can hear a little bit more about what's going on around me in this space but there's a little bit more focus on durability and cost savings when you use an element like this. The Yeti Pro is unique in that it utilizes three of these elements to provide you with a more flexible recording rig, and that it can change the shape of how it's recording, either pointing directly at your subject, wrapping all the way around the mic, or lighting up the front and back of the mic if you want to do sort of a backup singer style <laughs> recording with two people facing off on one microphone. But problems can pop up when you're using more sensitive recording equipment, especially if you're needing to do your recordings in in an untreated space, like a bedroom, your living room, or a closet. But we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to the proper large diaphragm condenser. Dynamic microphones are some of the oldest mics still in operation today. This design has remained relatively unchanged for a very long time. This specifically is a Shure SM57, and I've got a little foam windsock here on the front of it. But the design of this mic has not changed since the mid-60s. Dynamic microphones work a lot like how your speakers work, but in reverse. There's a little diaphragm, there's a little pad here that's uh, accepting the vibrations from my voice, and it's wiggling a magnet and some copper coils, and that tiny little electrical signal gets carried down that cable, and that's how we make the sounds that you hear. Dynamic microphones are known for being ultra durable. In fact, there's a great video of some people taking an SM58. That's the one that's got the little silver ball on the front and running over it with a car and freezing it in a block of ice and the mic is still functional. Dynamic mics are often also used in radio stations because a radio station is a very busy environment and one of the reasons why is because they're typically a little less articulate and a little less sensitive than their condenser cousins. Now on first blush, that might sound like a bad thing. Why would we want a microphone that's less sensitive or less accurate? And many people do complain about the sound of a dynamic microphone being a little duller around the edges. But these mics can really come in handy if you don't have a lot of soundproofing or sound treatments in your recording space. They feature an intense rejection. That means the front of the mic is very active, but by the time we get to the rear of the mic, it's pretty well dead. You're having a much harder time hearing my computer fan running in the background. Because they're a little less sensitive, that means you do have to work them a bit closer closer than a condenser microphone, which sort of adds to that really aggressive or punchy sound that you hear on FM radio. It's very much like someone is talking right on top of your ear. Just an example of that lack of sensitivity, you can see if I double the distance between me and the microphone, I get a lot quieter. 
Dynamic microphones are often one of my first recommendations for people just getting started in voiceover or looking at a solution for podcasting. They're not the sexiest, but they're often less expensive than their studio-grade condenser relatives. And when you spend more money on a nicer mic, that means you also need to spend more money treating your space so that you get higher quality recordings with less distracting background noise. Even though I have some insane mics in my collection, I often turn to the SM57 for most of my recording in my home office. And this is the mic that you'll see in all of my podcasts and hangouts. A close relative to the dynamic mic, which you may or may not have heard of in passing recording conversation, is the ribbon mic. While a dynamic microphone works a little like a speaker does, but in reverse, there's a cone which absorbs the energy of your voice, a ribbon microphone works via a ribbon. There's a horseshoe magnet and a thin metal strip which floats within that magnet and the vibrations of your auditory energy vibrate that ribbon and then that's carried into an electrical signal that is then picked up by a preamp and a converted into ones and zeros in your computer. Ribbon microphones can be very tricky to use. As you might imagine, that ribbon is even less sensitive and even less articulate than a proper dynamic microphone. And these mics do a wonderful job of accentuating low frequency sound, but if you're not careful, those recordings can get really muddy. That exposed ribbon element can be very fragile. An errant P-pop of air might be all it takes to knock the ribbon out of alignment with the magnet. And because the ribbon floats in a horseshoe, all ribbon mics are in some way figure of eight, which means the front of the mic is live, and the rear of the mic is live, while the sides are pretty well dead. I would definitely caution against beginners jumping straight to a ribbon mic for their first recording solution, but for those of you who have a little bit more experience in front of mics and mixers, these can be a beautiful way to add a little rumble or a little bass or to get that kind of soft around the edges old school recording sound. The times I've used them for spoken word recording, exceedingly rare, but I love putting mics like these in front of honky or buzzy instruments like saxophones and trumpets. Now we gotta talk about the shotgun. This is a specialty mic that you'll most often see for video and film production. It's a very long, skinny mic, which was originally designed to live on the end of a boom pole, feet or yards away from the subject you're trying to record audio from. You'll also see variations on this style of microphone bolted to the tops of cameras. Like if you ever go to a convention, you see people with these long skinny things protruding from the hot shoe on your camera, it's most likely a shotgun microphone. Throughout most of the country, shotgun microphones are used in video production situations where you're either out on location or you just are not capable of clipping a microphone to your actor or subject or interviewee. Much to my chagrin here in Los Angeles, we've really started to use these microphones a lot for voiceover production. When you pull them off set and put them in a studio, working a microphone like this, this closely, produces a very punchy and a very aggressive sound. These are mics that you'll very often see for recording television promos. You know, those pukey voices that come in between your shows to tell you what's coming up next. Thursday nights on Fox. One of the reasons why these mics started getting utilized more in studio is that they provide some of the benefits of a good dynamic microphone. It's a very thin recording signal pointing laser focus style out the front of this microphone. They do a fairly decent job of rejecting off the sides of the mic, but they are louder, crisper, and more articulate than their dynamic cousins. But they are powered condenser microphones, and the recording shape of this microphone does intend for a little environmental noise to make its way into the recording. If you're on location, you want a sense of what's happening around your actor, but you want the main focus of the mic pointing at your actor. Because of that, you can actually hear just a little bit more fan noise coming from my computer and my ceiling fan because it's summer in the valley and it's freaking hot. And while this mic will reject better than a large diaphragm condenser, it won't reject quite as well as a dynamic mic. A mic like this might solve some of your problems if you're recording in an untreated space, but the price tag for a nice shotgun is going to be substantially higher than for a decent dynamic mic. And of course, there are mics that you can clip directly to your subject. Think about what happens when you're shooting video. The mics on your camera are usually very far away from your subject. Instead of putting a mic on a stick, we can attach a mic directly to the actor or interviewee subject that you're trying to shoot video of. And just so you sound like you know what you're talking about, don't call these things clip-on mics. They're lavaliers or LAVs for short. The nice thing about a lavalier is they're very discreet, especially in situations where it's acceptable to show the microphone on camera, like an interview or a documentary. LAVs are also designed to pick up a sense of the environment around your subject, but obviously the main focus of the recording is gonna be whatever you attach them to. There have been a few times where I've been cleaning up audio from a lav and subtly, very distantly in the background of the recording, you can sometimes hear an actor's heartbeat. Because of their small size, you can also get very creative in hiding them in clothing. Say you're 
doing a scripted piece, uh, piece of fiction and you don't want the mic to be seen on camera, you can hide it up in the hair, you can hide it in between layers of clothing, and sometimes just attach it directly to skin if you've got the right type of sport tape. And we're starting to see some really cool solutions for labs that plug directly into our phones. This is one from Sennheiser, and they make some phenomenal labs, and they've made one for the iPhone, which plugs directly into the lightning port connector on your phone. Lavaliers can come in wired and wireless flavors, but shopping them can be a little tricky, and I would still hold to the adage that a cheap lav is probably not a good lav, and a good lav is probably not a cheap lav. Still, if it's the right tool for the job, these things are extremely versatile recording solutions. And that, friends, brings us to the most common and yet most diverse style of studio-grade microphone, the large diaphragm condenser. <laughs> these are the loudest, the brightest, and the most articulate mics, so when we're talking about sexy studio microphones, we're usually talking about a really nice large diaphragm condenser. Now, there's a one-inch gold diaphragm on the inside of this mic, which is powered by an outside source. All of the mics that we've reviewed in this video have been powered by my little Olympus LS10, but when you step up to studio-grade equipment, you're probably going to be utilizing some kind of Firewire USB audio interface, which is then probably connected to some other dedicated box like a preamp just to power the microphone. That's what makes these mics super crisp and crystal clear, but that clarity comes at the expense of durability, and these mics cannot be handheld for recording situations. You will almost always have to mount a large diaphragm condenser. You'll never see one of these mics out on stage. They're super fragile. Not only are these mics the most diverse, they also come in a couple different flavors. I mentioned they have a one-inch gold diaphragm. If you have one of those diaphragms, that's a mic that's just going to point straight out towards the front of the mic element, but you can also add a a second diaphragm which will allow you to tune the mic and change its recording shape so you can make it record just in front or in front and behind or all the way around the mic and for many of these higher grade premium studio grade mics you can even shape within those major settings a single multi-pattern large diaphragm condenser can be an extremely versatile tool to use in a recording studio setting while there's a ton of diversity in design and diversity in application there's also so a lot of diversity in price. Large diaphragm condensers can be priced out from $100 all the way up to tens of thousands of dollars. And before you gadget nerds start moaning and pissing around with, is the mic that expensive worth it for the monies? A mic that expensive absolutely is worth it, but maybe not for the reasons you might think. Once you start building out of the mid-range for a large diaphragm condenser, you start cresting over that two to $300 price point, you're paying less and less for quality. It's a steep diminishing return on how good the recording signal is. What you will start paying for are color, tone, and characteristics. The frequencies of sound that each of these mics will start highlighting or ignoring. There's even a variation of the large diaphragm condenser called a tube microphone, which utilizes an old school glass bulb valve wired into the circuitry and electronics of this mic to purposely degrade the quality of the recording in a way that we find sort of old school, vintagey, colorful, and pleasing. That's what makes it so important to pair the right mic microphone with the right instrument, person, or subject. When source and microphone are really working together and the mic is highlighting all of the elements of the source that you care about, it can be a really magical experience. And when you're in a professional setting, if that means you have to throw $10,000 at a microphone to get exactly the right color and sound that you want, well, that's the bill you gotta pay. It's a lot like camera lenses. You might want to own a piece of vintage glass because it draws out color in a way that you think is pleasing. And this mic is picking up the buzzing from my lights. So if these large diaphragm condensers are so great, why don't we try to use them for everything? Like I mentioned before, there are issues with durability. You can't handhold a large diaphragm condenser. It needs to be mounted and stable. Plus, there are plenty of times where we don't actually value accuracy. Things like mouth noise and breathing and the little clicks and clacks and saliva and... A mic that's more accurate and articulate is going to do a really good job of picking up all of that extra flotsam and jetsam in your recording. And lastly, as I'm sure you can hear, this is doing a much better job of soaking up the noise in my office than some of the other mics that we've tested. Which means to get the full benefit of upgrading to a really nice studio-grade large diaphragm condenser, 
you're going to have to invest some time and money in making sure that you're surrounding it with the proper treatments and trappings so that there aren't distracting elements getting picked up by the super accurate diaphragms built into this mic. I can't tell you the number of times I've had to pause this recording because a car is driving down the alley right outside my window here. Folks, I hope this video has helped illustrate, illuminate, and educate. It's not enough to say you want to shop a nice microphone. You really want to weigh the application against the various tools that you might have in your arsenal to achieve better sound for your videos, for your voiceover auditions, for your podcasts, vlogs, etc., etc. And this primer is only barely scratching the surface on the myriad number of combinations of different pieces of gear and recording interfaces and software and preamps and compressors and limiters and EQ. But I think it's a really fun journey if you take a couple steps down. You just want to be careful not to become too much of a collector of these different pieces as it's really easy to develop a case of gear acquisition syndrome. Yes, I do have a bad case of gas. As always, folks, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe for more tutorials like these and I would not be able to continue producing on this channel if you all weren't out there supporting it by using the fan funding links, shopping with my Amazon affiliate links, and sharing these videos on your favorite social sites like Twitter and Facebook and Reddit and the Googles Plus, so please keep bringing more cool people to the party. Hit that thumbs up button, and I will catch you all on the next video. And if you ever find someone who's talking into the top of the Yeti as opposed to the side of the Yeti, you should probably go ahead and let them know they're doing it wrong.